probably even longer. Um, as you'll have noticed, um, we've, we've just been joined on stage by, uh, by our special guest. Um, anybody who was here last year, um, I think we've been talking about it all year if you were here last year. I mean, and we're really, really pleased and really proud of uh, our association with our mate, because uh, he's our mate now. You know, uh, he's officially our mate, and uh, our mate agreed to come back again. So I'd like to introduce, because he doesn't need any introduction. Conway's sisters, brothers, welcome to conference, Ricky Tomlinson. Thank you very much, Will. Will. Lovely. Thanks very much. Uh, I've, I've, I've really only come along to speak for a few minutes because um, really it's just to thank you about what you've been doing for us since last year. Uh, but I've just been talking to uh, my comrade here who tells me that you've got Arthur Scargill speaking tomorrow. Now Arthur is a personal friend of mine. And I want to tell you a true story about me and Arthur. Arthur was sitting in my house in Liverpool uh, five years ago. And we were having a cup of tea and a sandwich. And it was a Wednesday afternoon and I said, Arthur, what are you doing on Saturday night? Are you around Liverpool at all? And he said, um, I don't know, I might be. Why, what's the problem? I said, not a problem. I said, they're putting a, a big party on for my 70th birthday. I said, it's going to be great. I said, all the local entertainers are going to be there. Ken Dodd and Mick Miller and all the boys. There's two live bands and a disco. Hot and cold buffet. I said, everything. And I said, and the bar is absolutely free. He said, that sounds good. He said, that sounds good. He said, where are you having it? I said, in the club, more conservative club. He said, bollocks to you in the conservative <laughs> club. And he never went. <laughs> and he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go. I said, Arthur, it's only a Conservative club in name. No, there's not a bloody Conservative goes in there. But anyway, I love Arthur, and I'm going to be mentioning Arthur. I don't want to go over everything I said last year because I'll bore you to death. But for anyone here who, who's maybe a bit younger and didn't understand, in 1972, we building workers had the first, or well, the one and only ever, official building strike that there's ever been. But it was very, very successful. And although I'm a scouser, I was living in a little council house in North Wales with my wife and two small boys. And obviously working on the Wrexham bypass, uh, by trade I'm a city and girls plasterer, but as you know anyone who's in the building industry work is very, very scarce. So I was working as a glorified labourer with the health and safety gang. And of course the strike was called, we got, we, we got uh, visited by the lads, we took a vote and decided obviously to come out and join the strike. Although I was, as I say, a scout said I was asked to be the, the mouthpiece for the, for, the, for the site, and that's what I've done. And I never missed a single meeting, which we held every week in the Bull and Stirrup. I went on the picket line every single day, and as I say, I was practically in charge of the North Wales area. And we had a very, very successful, a very, very successful uh, campaign. We were out for 12 weeks, and uh, we got the biggest pay rise that the industry's ever had. But it wasn't only about pay, it was about health and safety. Because what people don't realise in the building industry then, and it's not a lot better now, by the way, someone died every day. A building worker died somewhere in the country every day when they went to work. The fatality rate in the building industry was equal to that of the mining industry and the farming industry put together. And that's what we were out for, better health and safety. But as I say, the strike went well. We actually visited on the day eight sites. The seventh site was called Brookside, which played a part in my life a little bit later on. <laughs> but we were accompanied by 60 to 80 policemen, because we were in coaches and they were in a coach. And we went on the site, the Brookside site. We'd done what we had to do. We called a meeting got the lads who agreed to go on strike and to, to, to join in the dispute, and that was it. I went back to work, the lads all went home, that was it. Until 15 weeks later, I was visited on the site by two detectives who said, can we have a word? I said, what is it? He said, uh, we've been looking into your family background here, he said, and you come from quite a, quite a, a, a respectable family. I said, well, thanks very much. He said, so what we want you to do is we're going to bring some charges against these pickets and we want you to be a prosecution witness. 
I said, how can I be a prosecution witness? I said, I was in charge of this. I was in charge of the whole site. They'd done everything I asked the lads to do. And nine times out of ten when I went to a meeting, if they said something I didn't agree with, I would vote if I was on my own. If I didn't agree with it, I would put my hand up and say so. And one of the things I did disagree with, and time and time again I voted against it, was they would put a motion forward that if some firms who were out on strike agreed to pay their building workers the rate we were asking for, they should be allowed to go back to work but pay a pound levy into the strike fund. And I said, that's wrong, that's out of order. You can have two families living side by side, one fella's working and throwing a pound into the strike fund, the other fella's out on strike, he might have the same amount of kids or whatever, and he's not getting a carrot. In my opinion, I've told him, and i said it time and again, the rules are, it's one out, all out, one back, and then we all go back. Not in dribs and drabs, that's finished with. Well, anyway, cut the story short. The police said I have to say, well, we'll have to charge you. And, you know, listen to this. This is the depth to which the employers will go to get their own way. As I say, I'm a plasterer by trade. McAlpine's offered me a job to go to Portugal and manage a new road that was being built through Portugal. Well, I can tell you, I can't read the theodolite. So it would have ended up like Spaghetti Junction if I'd have gone. I haven't got a clue. But that's what they were prepared to do. Send me out there to Portugal on bus wages to get me out of the way. So obviously the police said, well, if you're not going to do what we asked you, we'll prosecute you. And they did. And what happened is we went on trial. The trial, lasted, by the way, when, when we went on trial, the day of the court, 4,000 police on duty. 4,000 police. Can you imagine that? More than for the IRA bombers, more than for the, the Cray twins, more than for spies. 4,000 police on duty. And I was late getting there. And as I went to go in, this copper, because we were standing shoulder to shoulder, he said, you can't come in here. I said, that suits me, thanks very much. <laughs> and when he realised who I was, he said, well, you better get in there now. And I went in, and I want to tell you, I'd never been in trouble with the police in my life then. Didn't have a clue about a court, a crown court at that. So there's all the briefs, all in their wigs and their gowns, and the judge in his red and whatever. And the trial lasted for 55 days. And it cost, in today's money, between 10 and 15 million pound. That's how keen they were to get a guilty verdict. Well, obviously, I can't go through it all, so I'm just going to say a few of the little things. They couldn't come to a verdict on me and Desi. So the judge said to him, well, I'll tell you what, these are going back to jail for the night. You go to a hotel which has been set up for you and carry on discussing the case. Now, that's illegal. The only place they can actually discuss the case and what's going on is in the jury room. So they went off, we went to, back to jail for the night. We come back the next morning. And within 15 minutes, they had reached the verdict. It had been 8-4 the night before. It was now 10-2. Guilty by a 10-2 verdict. So we started handing out the sentences. This fella suspended, suspended, suspended. Now, Mackie Jones, who was here on the left of me, Mackie Jones got nine months. Now, that to me was worse than what I got and worse than what Desi got although our sentences were a lot more severe, and I'll tell you why his was worse, because he was the treasurer of the strike committee. And on the day where this alleged conspiracy was taking place, he wasn't there. He'd been, he'd collected the subs that had been sent in from factories and the railways and the docks, he'd signed for the money and he'd gone. He'd gone before the meeting started. And when his barrister said this to the judge, the judge said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, a nod's as good as a wink. And Mackie got nine months. And then he come to me, and I made a statement from the, from the dock, and I read it out, and he said, I'm neither going to increase nor decrease your sentence because you've spoken. And I was given three lots of two years, two years for each of the three offences we were charged with. And with that, the jury foreman and his mate jumped up, 
turned round and started physically fighting, boxing with other members of the jury. And the judge banged his gavel. These two lads got up, run out and went into the jury room. And he had to wait for them to come back out because Desi Warren hadn't been sentenced. So they, they were dragged out by the court usher and Desi got three threes. He got three years on, on each account. And Desi got worse than that really because, and what I'm going to say now, and I don't care who's here and I don't care who repeats this, they actually killed Desi Warren when he was in jail because he died from chemically induced Parkinson's from the shit they give him in jail. Now I took it once to give it you to help you to sleep. You become a zombie. I took it once. And so what we done then, me and Desi, we, when we got in, we got Mackie, we asked, Mackie got sent to an open prison because he just couldn't do it. He, he, he was, he, he took it terrible. And by the way, Mackie's wife had a little girl, 12 months old, and she was having her second baby when he got sentenced. And I met them a couple of years ago, and it's 43 years now since we've been jailed. Them girls only got told about his imprisonment two years ago because he was that ashamed to tell his daughters that he'd been in jail. But Mackie Jones now is a high flyer. He came out, went back to university, changed his job, flies all over the world. A real high flyer. The youngest of the pickets was a fella called Terry Renshaw. Terry Renshaw's only a baby, he's only 68. He got a suspended sentence, Terry. He went picketing on one day. He only went one day because he had a broken leg. But it was the day that the police were with us, and when they, did, when they were with us, by the way, on the day, they never took a name and address. They didn't charge anyone, they didn't caution anyone. They had to carry, carry Terry Renshaw into the dock with his leg in plaster and he got a suspended sentence and that Terry Renshaw is now he's now the Lord Mayor of Flint he's also a sitting councillor in Flint and he's also been on the North Wales Police Authority for bloody years so that's what they were dealing with they did know the cal anyway me and Desi decided that we weren't going to soldier and we wouldn't work we wouldn't do as we were told. We'd done most of our time in solitary confinement. We wouldn't wear clothes. So obviously, if you don't wear clothes, you can't have visits. And I can honestly tell you, the whole of the time I was in prison, I never once shut my own cell door. I said, I shouldn't be here, so I'm not locking myself in. If you want to lock me in, you shut the door. And I've actually seen prison officers fighting once on our side and others against us. Now I was sent to Leicester, I was sent to Leicester prison and I suffer from asthma and I was in what they call a segregation unit which is solitary confinement within solitary confinement so I was below ground level and I was ill one day, really bad, couldn't breathe extra day and one fella said put a blanket round him and take him for a walk round the moat it was an old castle and the other fella said no leave him and they actually ended up these two fighting, physically fighting. And in the end, this fella got hold of me, took, gave me, got another prisoner, and he walked me around the moat till I could get my breath back. So that's the sort of thing that went on. That's the sort of thing that went on. But you know, we do, we've done what we had to do. We were bloody nuisances. But then one day, I was in Leicester prison, and the governor there was a wonderful guy, a real, real nice man. He didn't walk around with other officers. He would walk around the prison on his own wore his own clothes, and he come in and he said, listen, Rick, he said, you know you're a, a political prisoner, don't you? I said, yes, I do, I said. I've actually been told in one of the, I was in 14 prisons, Desi was in 17. I said, I was in one of the prisoners, I said, and a Roman Catholic priest come in to see me. I said, I'm not a Catholic, but he came in to see me, and he was talking to me, and he said, now listen, you realise you're a political prisoner? I said, yes, I do. He said, well, there's six, there's six in jail in Great Britain at the moment. Now, I haven't got a clue. Who the, other, who the other four were. It was me and Desi, and the other two of them were the Price sisters who were uh, Irish um, terrorists. So we, who the others were, I don't know. But even then, they knew we were polit political prisoners. And, and this will become relevant in a couple of minutes. But one day, the governor came in to see me, and this is the man, by the way, who gave me the ragged trousered philanthropist. And that changed my life 
It absolutely changed my life and it changed my, my politics. And I've sent them all over the world. People have read articles. I've sent them to China. I've sent them to Russia. I've sent them to Canada. I've sent them to America. I said, anyone who writes to me for a, for, a, for a copy, I send them. So anyway, he, got a, he came to me one day and he said, listen, Rick, he said, uh, you've got a visit tomorrow. I said, no, I, I, said I, I don't have visits. So I won't wear clothes. He said, no, this is a bit different. He said, the visit is in my office, in the governor's office. He said, you've got to come. And I, I said, I, he said, you've got to come. And I, I trusted him, you know. So the next day, I put a pair of uh, shorts on. I went up to his office. And there was three blokes there. A lad called Alan Abrams, who was a joiner on a teaching hospital in Liverpool. Billy Jones, a lad from Kirby, another joiner from a teaching hospital. And there was an MP from the Midlands called Tom Litterick. And Tom Litterick said, now listen, Rick, he said, um, you've got to go home. And I was about 18 months, I think, 17 or 18 months into my sentence. I said, listen, I'm not going anywhere. I've seen my wife. She knows the score. I've lost all my remission. I've got to do me full time. And he went, no. He said, listen, we're not asking you. We're telling you, you've got to go home. Because Desi Warren, and I didn't know up till then, Desi Warren, it was in a bad way health-wise. And he said, Rick, if you don't go home, Desi's got to, if you do your full time, Desi will make sure he does his full time. And Rick, we're frightened of him not making it. They knew this is how serious it was. Well, we'd made a pact. We'd made a pact. We wouldn't do anything, we wouldn't soldier, we wouldn't work. And I had to write him a letter, because I couldn't tell him what was going on. He said, don't mention it, don't tell him, because you know what he is. I said, I dear Desi, I'm missing the kids, I want to go home, blah, blah, blah. And he sent me a terrible letter back, a dreadful letter. He may as well have stabbed me, he said, you cowardly bastard. You cowardly bastard. I thought we were mates, I thought we could trust each other. And he gave me this letter, it was awful. And 48 hours later, I was let out of Leicester Prison, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. The Wales Press was there, and Paul Foote, a journalist, uh, Jim Nicholls, the civil liberties lawyer, Peter Carter from Birmingham, and that was it. And uh, I went around the country then, talking about Desi, trying to get him out. I went to the TUC conference in Blackpool, where I, where I was expelled. It was headline news on the 6 o'clock news, me ranting and raving from the gallery because he wouldn't let me get up to speak. And, and, and the, the delegates were shouting, let him speak, let him speak. And the electricians union, a fellow called Brakewell, was saying, don't, don't let him speak. Don't let him speak. He's a thug. He's a political thug. And it was murder. And we got thrown out. That was the headlines. That was the headlines. But anyway, a couple of weeks later, Desi was released. But he wasn't released at 8 o'clock in the morning. He was released at midnight. And he went out the back door with no one. No one knew he was there. And it was many years before I seen Desi, because when I come out, I found out there was stuff going on in his private life that I couldn't go and see him and tell him. And I got a little letter one day, I, was going, I got a little letter shoved under the door. It just said, Rick, Desi, I'd love to see you. And he gave me a address in chest, and I went to this address, and I, I, I shouted, hello, and a, a woman's voice shouted, come in. And I went in, and I walked through to the lounge, and there's Desi lying on a mattress lying on a mattress on the floor with a rope from the floor screwed into one of the joists and he pulled himself up he kissed me and he said you know how long it is rick and i said desi you don't because he knew he knew what had gone on he knew why i hadn't been to see him and you know he never worked again his hair was snow white the last time I went out with him was actually with Arthur Scargill and Desi the night before the Durham Miners Gala where he was strapped in a wheelchair and couldn't hold his head up. But that's what he'd done. That's what he'd done to him. And when he got buried, there was only one national trade union leader at the funeral. And again, that was Arthur Scargill. He was there. So we had a little go. And I think we'd done the trade union movement proud. I think we showed the authorities that you can fucking put us in prison, but we won't do what we're told because we, what we were doing was right and proper and all we wanted was justice. So I'm going to finish off by saying this. The oldest of the uh, pickets now is 
fella called Ken O'Shea, he's 89. We lost one of the lads last week, he was 86. We've got a couple in their late 80s. Ken is losing his marbles now, and I want to make a documentary. I want to go around and get as many stories from them and from their wives and from their kids about what went on. But I just want to thank you people because not only for that wonderful sculpture that you, give, you gave me last year, which is on the mantelpiece on one side, and on the other side is a piece of coal that has been sculptured, which I'd got from the miners. And as you probably know, my dad was a baker. I loved him. I absolutely loved him. And he'd have been made up to be here today, either on the platform or sitting down there. He was tremendous. But I just want to show you about how, how you, people can say, how do you know you're a political spot, a, a political person? I'll, I'll tell you why. For any of you who you can use that laptop or the i files, whatever you call them, and get the stuff up. There's a program called, um, what's it called? Laptops, you know the thing. Wi-Fi's. Wi-Fi. I have to get me. I have to get my grandson to fix me bloody phone. Never mind. <laughs> There's a program there called True Spies. Now I want you to get it, and I want you to watch it. It's about me, and Arthur Scargill, and Peter Hain. And what they do? They're talking about me, and a fella's face comes on the screen. He's the MI5 man who was sent to monitor me, the MI5 man, the special agent who was monitoring me. And he said to him, what was, who was Tomlinson and what was he? He said, Tomlinson was an agitator and a political thug. And in the same program, they say to Arthur Scargill, and this is one of the best, best ever replies I've ever heard in my life. Mr. Scargill, would you be surprised to learn that during the miners' dispute, six members of the NUM executive were in the pay of MI5. And Arthur said, yes, I would be surprised. I thought it would have been a lot more than that. <laughs> Fabulous. But Peter Hain, Peter Hain is in the same programme because round about that time he was leading the anti-apartheid regime. And he was arrested and charged with armed bank robbery. Of course, he got away with it because he was nowhere to be seen. He just had someone like him in, on the CCTV. And got, so I wrote to Peter Haynes not long ago, and I wasn't very happy with the reply we got. He just said, we know all about the case, but unfortunately, I don't want to get involved in the campaign. Don't ask me why, but there you go. But as I say, uh, I'm just going to finish off by saying, We've got a wonderful researcher who's been doing all, all the gear for us. Her name's Eileen Turnbull, and she's like a Rottweiler. Well, no, she's more than a... I was going to say a terrorist, but you, uh, at least you can negotiate with a terrorist, can't you, brother? <laughs> Eileen Turnbull has got papers that would make you a bloody hair curl. She's found papers right up, right up to Ted Heath, setting a unit up against us, setting us up as all sorts of, I mean, the trial was political from day one and she's got the papers. And what the main thing is, when we were in prison, I was, as I say, I was doing uh, two years, um, three times, Desi was doing three threes. She found a document by a fella called Lawrence Lusgarten, who's a visiting law professor who's still working in Oxford. And he said, he wrote a letter in the law journal and said, these sentences are illegal. The most these fellas could have got was three months. And she delved a bit further. And she found out that the Home Secretary had been informed about this. And he'd wrote to the Attorney General saying, look at this. They're still in jail, but the most he could have got was three months. And the she got the letter, the reply from the Attorney General saying, you're right. But their defence team have missed it, so leave them where they are. So they knew. But our defence team hadn't missed it. Because my junior, who's a very, very well-respected High Court judge now, called David Altaris, we got his documents and he said, these sentences are illegal. The most these lads could have got is three months. So when we went to prison, we were in for five months. We came out on appeal. 
And we had to go in front of a fellow called Lord Justice Salmon. But when we got there, Lord Justice Salmon had gone west. John West. <laughs> Lord Justice Salmon had gone west. And sitting in his place was uh, Goddard, the Lord Chief Justice, the, the number one guy. And he squashed two of the charges. And when it comes to the sentencing, he said to our barristers, do you want to challenge the sentences? And they said, no. They said, no. But they had the proof that the sentences were illegal. So I can only assume that they were got at. Anyway, it's all water under the bridge. The battle goes on. We've been in touch with the CCRC. They've got all sorts of evidence. They've, in, they've uh, interviewed Desi's wife, who's now 81 and frail, in a little home. And uh, they've done all sorts of things. But uh, listen, I'm just going to finish off by saying this. We're going to get there. We're going to bring this to a conclusion. It's not for our sake, because it, I'm ready to hand my knife and fork, and I haven't got long for this world. What I'm saying is, is this is about my kids and your kids and your grandkids. Keep up the fight and don't give in. Onwards and upwards. Thank you very much.